that's what I want to do. If you haven't been with us, we've been in this series called Parented, which I think has something to do with parenting, but I also like to think it has lots to do with lots of other things. And this morning, uh, th- there's a couple questions that I-, I feel like my whole God construct kind of is constantly bumping up in between them and the way I understand life and leadership and everything else. But I think it's particularly relevant to parenting. And before we get into them, I, I guess I just want to acknowledge, like, it's not lost on me that these are questions that, that many of you have thought a lot about. And even if you haven't thought, like, intentionally about it, uh, the, the reality is, is that uh, because of your Myers-Briggs, because of your Enneagram, because of your family background, like, y- you have some strong opinions on these questions and really the continuum that exists between them. And so it's not my goal this morning to, to solve any problems. It's not my goal to suggest that here's the answer to the problems. In fact, if I could come up with the answer, then my emotional health would be a lot higher myself, so I don't have the answer. But I do think, especially as we talk about parenting, and to another degree, any kind of relationship and any kind of influence, I, I think this is a, a continuum, a tension uh, that, that we've got to constantly be reminding ourselves exists. And it kind of goes like this, that to what degree... And, and, I was ambitious and I was going to do ropes and clothespins and all this stuff. And then this morning I was like, no, that's all lame. I'm just going to do tape and stools. Uh, but I guess what the question I want to ask is, to what degree is our, our job as parents uh, to protect our kids from pain? Like, to what degree is, is that the goal? Uh, and to what degree is it our job as parents to allow our kids to learn from their mistakes and, and, and the freedom to choose things? Like... Uh, and obviously, this is one of those situations where the extreme is not the answer in any case, and that we kind of, that's the obvious part. The, the hard part is, like, where, where do we exist within this, within this tension? Like, to what degree is our job as parents to protect people, protect our kids from, from pain, uh, from making stupid choices? And to what degree is our job as parents uh, to allow them to make choices that result in pain? Like, to what degree is the end game their safety and survival to 80 years old? And to what degree is the end game things like resilience and confidence and courage, which are the things that we develop when we learn, uh, when we get to make choices and, and screw all that up. Now, I suspect that for many of you, have, I've hit the nerve. Uh, maybe in your frustration and trying to understand God, probably the reason that you and your spouse go see a therapist to talk about parenting. Because one of the tensions here is in, in any marriage, there generally isn't two people who think alike on this issue. Uh, because of family of origin, because of our own background and DNA and all those different things, we we tend to come at this from different angles. And I guess this morning, I just kind of want to elevate this conversation a little bit more so that we at least know that within this thing called parenting, and and you do know this, but I just want to provoke conversation on, like, how, how are we processing this? And I guess my hope is that we're also realizing that this isn't just a conversation about parenting, right? Like, this is a, parent, a conversation about what it means to be the manager, what it means to be the supervisor, what it means to be the boss, what it means to be the owner, what it means to be the coach. In many cases, what it means to be the friend. Like, at what point is it our job to just make the decision because we know the right one and therefore we cannot make the same mistake? And what degree is it our job as a boss uh, to allow the mistakes to occur so that people learn that way? You with me on this? Like, h- how do we understand this? Uh, Mark Gregston uh, he, he tells a story in, in his parenting book, which some of you have loved and some of you have hated, and that's okay because uh, that, that's kind of life. And uh, I, I think he has some helpful things to say, but he is from Texas, and therefore he does come at life um, from his own cultural perspective. But in uh, the opening of his book or in, in one of his chapters, he talks about this tension. And he tells a story about a woman uh, who brought her quote-unquote rebellious son to see him. And before the session started, she's like, okay, just to kind of clear the air, he's rebellious, but I just want you to know, like, here's the expectations we have for him at home, and here's the list. Uh, date Christians only, and only hang out with Christian kids, pray daily, and go to church. So she's straight-faced as telling Mark, like, here's what he knows, here's what we have on the list, here's what's on the bulletin board, here's what he has to do every day. Pray daily and go to church, this is an integral part of your life. Do chores promptly with cheerful, positive attitude. <laughs> have at least one hobby you're always doing, read a minimum of two books a month. Sundays are for family time, rest and visit, Uh, don't get in a rut, strive to be in a leadership position, learn to have healthy relationships, plan tomorrow the night before, it helps you be productive, eat four fruits and five vegetables a day and no gluten, Uh, that doesn't actually say that, Uh, eat no more than one, eat no more than one dessert a week, maximum intake of red meat two times a week, exercise three times a week for 45 minutes, drink eight glasses of water each day, and just to clarify, they're eight ounce glasses of water. Uh, Keep yourself physically, mentally, and spiritually in shape. No sex before marriage and no fast women. No tobacco or alcohol ever. 
No reckless driving. Don't whine or play a victim. Pick your friends with caution. Be grateful. Write thank you notes to everyone who gives you something. Shower daily. Nobody likes a stinky person. Brush and floss your teeth two times a day. Smile. It makes everyone feel better. Happiness is a choice, so choose to be happy. (laughs) Tell parents good morning and good night with a hug and a kiss. Dream big, sacrifice, work hard, and don't quit. Dedicate yourself to schoolwork projects and work and the Lord. No porn, nor horror movies, and limit TV to five hours per week. I can't imagine why he's in the therapist's office. Can you? <laughs> and we laugh. And I, I, part, part of why I want to do that is like, that's low-hanging fruit, right? Like, even a control freak like myself can see, like, that goes too far. But it raises the point. Like, h- how far? Like, How many steps too far did it go? And here's one of the questions that I hope this morning that we can provoke to the surface is, which of those things on her list, which of them did she get to learn by experience, and which of of those was she just prescribed and she accepted that? Like, there's some irony even there, isn't there? Like, how many of those things did she get to learn by example, or or by her own experience, rather? And how many of them did her parents create a similar list for her, and she just kind of went, yep, okay, I'll do that? That, that gets at this whole thing, doesn't it? Of As parents, as leaders, as owners, as bosses, how are we interacting within this tension? And there's a whole other question of how does God interact within this tension? And that's kind of where I want to go this morning. I don't know that we can answer the question for God either. Uh, if we could, we'd have a whole lot less denominations and many fewer churches and probably less atheists. But there is this genuine text that the Bible is constantly getting at, and it's this, to what degree is God controlling everything, and to what degree is he leaving room for us to choose? And to to be sure, you could open the Bible and you could cherry-pick any number of stories to support whatever extreme you wanted. But I do want to suggest that if you pick Jesus, you get a different kind of a view on this. That, yeah, sure, within the whole scope of 66 books, you can do lots of things, But Jesus sure seemed to interact in a way that at least leans in a direction. It at least uh, suggests that that this God is almost hazardous in his value of freedom. You know, when I was uh, kind of trying to learn parenting and researching parenting this last summer, we've talked about that. Like part of what prompted me is like, man, my tools are dull. I got to get after this and study some more stuff. And at the same time, in my own morning time, I was reading through the book of Mark. And so you probably picked up on that, that we could have called this a series on Mark as much as a series on parenting, because that's where all my kind of textual insight for all this has come. But there's one story in Mark 6 that in one sense, I, I love it. In the other sense, I hate it. It's right at the middle of what confuses me and yet drives me theologically in my understanding of God. And it starts this way in Mark chapter 6. It says, Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. So last week, we were kind of in the middle of this whole story with Herod. So in Mark 6, we're picking up in this place where Jesus went back to Nazareth. Now, one of the things we have to get out of our heads is that every time Jesus went somewhere, it was him and 12 people. We know by now that that's not necessarily the case, that, that there was this mob of people that have went with him. So we don't know exactly how many people were in Nazareth, But we know that at one point there was enough attention being brought to Jesus that on synagogue that particular Saturday they went like, hey, you you, you should teach. Or would that have been Friday night? I'm not clear. When the Sabbath came, uh, he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were amazed. Now, amazed is a pretty generic word, isn't it? That could be a good thing. That could be a bad thing. Uh, That could be, wow, this is awesome. That could be, oh, this is horrifying. And that's what Mark, the narrator, is trying to get at here. The people ask, where did this man get these things? So whatever it is he's talking about, they're new. Uh, They're new ideas. It's a perspective they haven't heard. He, He has their credentials, which is what gets him the platform, so to speak, at synagogue. But whatever it is he's saying, they've not heard much like this before. And it's important to bear that in mind as we read his life. What's this wisdom that's been given him? Now, wisdom doesn't necessarily mean agree. They're saying, where does he get this insight? Where does this perspective come from? And part of what we know is that Jesus was talking about the kingdom in a way that they hadn't heard it. And part of the tension that's coming to the surface is they grew up together. This is his hometown. The ladies in the synagogue, they wiped his butt in the nursery. These are the kids that he went to the playground together. They knew him well. This is Dallas Willard's like familiarity breeds, in, uh, breeds contempt, right? I think the way he says it is familiarity breeds uh, a lack of familiarity, and a lack of familiarity breeds contempt. So they're wondering, who, who is this guy? What are these remarkable miracles he's performing? So they're even recognizing he's doing stuff 
And we can't necessarily explain it, but we know that the rabbis that we learned from didn't teach us to do that. They didn't do that. So, so their attention is on him because he's saying some weird stuff and he's saying some different stuff. And at the same time, he's doing stuff that's different than anything they've done. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Like, th- these, we, we know this family, and there's nothing particularly great about this family. Uh, think of it this way. Uh, was parenting easier for Michael Jordan? Like, did he get home from work and his kids are like, oh, it's Michael Jordan, we better listen to him. You know, Michelle Obama, I, I think... I just caught myself in this thinking this week. Like, is the assumption that because she's Michelle Obama that when she parents her girls, they just listen? No, that's stupid, right? The reality is she, she, she's not the former first lady to them. She's mom. He, he, he's not the greatest basketball player to ever live. He's, he's another dad who doesn't really understand the time because they do math different now. Like, that's the tension these guys are feeling is, who are you? You're one of us. How dare you stray so far from the core? And it says this, and they took offense at him. So they weren't liking it. They were kind of offended by it, and probably for myriad reasons. It's kind of like Thanksgiving for you. You might be the boss. You you might be the leader. You might have uh, respect in your community or your people group, but at Thanksgiving dinner, you're just the son. You're you're the daughter, or you're the dad, or you're the uncle. You're You're just another one of them. But Jesus, something about his life is elevating the attention. And so his comment to this is to quote from his own scriptures, which more or less is to say, yeah, 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 this is the way this works. A prophet is honored everywhere but in his own house. Like Michelle Obama's kids don't listen to her any better than anybody else's because she's still just mom in that context. And then here's, here, here's the statement that I think uh, y- y- you could spend a lot of time just reflecting, reading, praying, cross-referencing, coming to your own conclusions about, but watch this. Uh, he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. Now, wait, wait, wait a minute. The Jesus who's about to raise from the dead, the Jesus who says to his dead buddy Lazarus, hey, come on out of the tomb, you're alive again. The Jesus who walks on water, the Jesus who looks at six loaves of bread and goes, no problem, I can feed thousands of people with that. The the Jesus who, who heals people and does any number of miracles and oh, by the way, whose mom is a virgin or at least was when he was born. That Jesus, the gospel writer Mark, the narrator here, and we've talked about like what Mark is saying is Jesus couldn't I mean, it's hard to even combine those two ideas, isn't it? Jesus couldn't? Like for some of us, especially if we have this high sovereign theology, this high God is completely other and outside of and can do anything he wants, we don't even like those two words on the page next to each other. He couldn't. Okay, so go wouldn't. In some ways, that makes it even more of a point. He couldn't couldn't do what? He, He can turn six loaves into enough food to feed thousands, he can heal someone from a lifelong uh, disease. He can, he can have a woman touch his prayer shawl and be healed uh, in a way that any doctor in town or in the country couldn't heal her, but he can't do what? He can't override his family member's right to choose. Now, okay, so they're adults. We, we could at least insert that into the conversation, but there's something going on there, isn't there? Like that this God who demonstrates throughout Jesus' life can interrupt natural law, it would seem, at any point. That seems to be one of the points. This guy is that guy. He can interrupt it if he wants to. But how does he get disciples? Through coercion or through invitation? That that God who can calm storms and his family member starts going, we think you're out to lunch. What does he do? Does he like Harry Potter them and turn them into a worm? No, he... Mark says he left, leaves town going, I couldn't do anything for them. It's tricky in the parenting realm, isn't it? And, and then there's this. The fact that he wouldn't, does that protect himself, Jesus? Does that protect him from pain? Or does it actually make his pain greater? The fact that he didn't, does that protect them from pain or does it actually make their pain greater? There's, there's a conversation here behind the story about pain and suffering and how God sees it versus, I think, the way we see it, about freedom and, and God's sovereignty and all these different things. 
Is Jesus naive to the fact that by giving them the right to choose, he's actually ensuring that they experience greater pain? I I don't think he is. In fact, uh, one of the things that to me makes Jesus so compelling is his honesty with He's not superficial on the subject of suffering. In, in John 16, he says this to kind of sum up a, a lot of things. He says, I've told you these things so that, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. What is that? It's another one of these continuums. The cultural American God who, if he's God, shelters us from suffering, the, the good news is that's not Jesus. The bad news is that's not Jesus. It doesn't seem to be the priorities with which he leads. Mark Gregston, one of the comments from that book that I I found to be really challenging is he says this, he says, as parents, our job is to convey to our kids, you live in a pain-filled world bent towards your destruction. I would argue this continuum, that's what creates the tension here, isn't it? Because we know the potential for pain. And so did God. And therefore, how do we interact within all this? Now, there's another story that stands out to me. And again, I just have to admit part of the danger of creating this conversation and jumping around is that you can jump around and prove lots of things. But there's a story in, in Luke 15 that, that is in many ways well known, but I think and oftentimes misunderstood. It's the story of the prodigal and his father. And actually, I just wanted to read because there's this familiar thing. Uh, Let me just kind of jump into this story because in many ways it's the high point of the way Jesus wants us to understand God. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now remember, culturally, uh, that younger son was entitled to nothing. So we're learning something about the father in the fact that he's going to leave something for the second son because by all rights, everything belonged to the older son. Now add to that the fact that the younger son has the audacity to more or less say, uh, to hell with you, like I just want it now. I don't really want you. I just want your stuff. Give it to me now. And the father does. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant, different country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. He went to college or something, right? <laughs> and he lived it up while playing in the dorms. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So the economy shifted. Whatever sense of false security he had developed, the rug was pulled out from under him. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to, feed his, to the fields to feed pigs. He became a meth dealer. He, he became a prostitute. She became a prostitute. She became a meth dealer. He, he picked a way of making a living for himself that was 180 degrees opposite of his cultural and family values. He longed to fill his pump stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Sir, Servant. So he got up and went to his father. Now notice, it's unclear to what degree he understands his father accurately. Because the fact that he's going to go says that he has some understanding of this father's grace and, and, and forgiving qualities. But the fact that he's kind of relegating himself to the spot of a servant says that we're not entirely sure how, much he, how clear he is on this father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Now, there are many good books that you could read on this, uh, but, but essentially what's going on here is that all cultural convention is being broken. This father, who by even today's Eastern cultural standards should have denied that he even had a son, not only doesn't just do that, but he's every day waiting for his son's return. And when his son does show up on the horizon, he throws dignity to the wind and goes running out to him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. To which the father says, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So there be, they, they began to celebrate. Now, I'll leave you to finish the story in your own chair time. But here's my question. What brought the son back? Was it the grace of the father? I think that's a hard argument to make from the story itself. But, but the, the storyteller, in this case Luke and Jesus, does give us this one little insight. And I didn't make this observation. Actually, Gregston made it. Watch this in verse 16. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him 
anything when he came to his senses. There's something going on there. In the story, it wasn't until the sun, so people stopped bailing the sun out that the sun actually came to his senses. You know, the last time I went to one of those drug treatment court graduations, there was a, a, a gal that had graduated. Her dad was there. And he said afterwards, he said it to somebody else. I was trying to remember who this week. It wasn't actually directly to me, but he said, so this gal had went through the drug treatment court. It was a several-year process for her, and we've talked about just uh, the heroic work that they have to do and the heavy overcoming of addiction that they have to work through. But the father said uh, he had spent $100,000 of his own money trying to get her through treatment. And it was all for naught until she finally got arrested and got a felony and started going through the system. What is that? It's a story about when he finally stopped doing things for her, isn't it? It's fascinating to me that the the prodigal has that story. Now, here's this question. When the prodigal father said, yep, here you go. I mean, I know know how this story ends, but, but here you go. Was he protecting himself from pain? Or was he actually hedging his bet that he would experience more of it? Was he protecting his son from pain? Or was he actually hedging his bet that he would experience more of it. See, I think part of what we have to, and this is me looking in the mirror, so if this is helpful to you, that's bonus. But part of what we have to look at here is oftentimes when we say it's in the name of them avoiding pain, it's really not their pain we're concerned about, is it? It's ours. Because when they suffer, we suffer times 10. Mark Gregson says it this way. Go ahead to that next slide. He says, teens know when you're out for them and when you're out for yourself. If your motivation is to help them get to a better place, they'll know it. If it's about you, they'll smell it from 100 miles away. Not easy. Henry Cloud, if you never read Boundaries, uh, then then I at least hope that you'll stick this story away because Henry Cloud and John Townsend wrote this phenomenal book on boundaries, which is really about this continuum, this tension, and how do we exist within this. And one of the kind of hallmark stories from that you may have heard, it involves a a father and mother and their two adult kids. So a father, I don't know why I'm finding this so hard to start this story, a man and a woman, uh, and then two of their adult kids, uh, a guy and a woman. And they're in his office, and this is early in his career, and and he looks at them and says, so what's going on? And the dad says, well, I'm here to talk about my son. And so Dr. Cloud turns and looks at the son, and he's like, so what's going on? And the son's like, not me, it's my brother. He's like, oh, so there's another brother who's not here. Yeah, there's another brother who's not here. Well, where is he? Well, he's in Vail. What's he doing in Vail? He's he's skiing. Huh, okay, so why, why, why why is he in Vail? Because he's with his buddies and he's skiing. So what's the problem? And the dad says, well, the problem is he's he's a drug addict. He's flunked out of a few different colleges. His mom and I have helped him on different cases and bought condos in some cases. We didn't have to live in the dorms and party and now and none of it's worked and he keeps flunking out and he keeps smoking weed and now and Dr. Cloud's like, so now he's in Vail. Yeah, he, he's in Vail. W- what's he doing there? I've already told you, he's skiing, but how is he there? Like, I can't afford to go to Vail and I have a job. How can your son afford to be in Vail? Well, and he kind of confesses, well, we feel guilty because he doesn't have a job and he doesn't have a career, so his mom and I, we kind of keep giving him money so that he has a way to eat and a place to live and so he goes to Vail with it. And it's this long kind of convoluted story, but eventually Dr. Cloud uh, looks at the husband and he says, hey, I hate to tell you, but your son doesn't have any problems. Which, of course, the father's offended. He's like, what do you mean he doesn't have any problems? He's a drug addict, he doesn't have any jobs, uh, he he can't keep a job, he has no career path, he can't stay in school. What do you mean he doesn't have any problems? And he's like, "Uh, sir, could I just point out to you that he's in Vail skiing with his friends. He has no problems. You, on the other hand, sir, you're sitting in a psychologist's office. You have some problems. (laughs) And of course, the father is deeply offended by this, but eventually what he conveys to the father is, listen, I can help you not have problems. And actually, the the best way I can help your son with his problems is to make that his problems are no longer your problems. And you can see where it goes. It's a conversation about, listen, you you need to stop sheltering him from what? Not, Not here, but from the pain of his choices. Now, I know this is simplistic, and I'm not suggesting this is easy in real life. That's why I say I don't necessarily have the solution, and I don't think you do either, but I do think collectively this has to be at the surface of our conversations as to what does it mean to be parented, and what does it mean to parent, and what of these pains do we protect from, and what of these pains do we go, you know what, you're probably going to have to learn that. How do we exist within that? But we know 
that part of the way we have to choose to exist is that we hurt too. And the point at which as a parent we go, it's really about me not experiencing pain? Very little good comes from that for anybody. Your story is probably ripe with mistakes made, lessons learned, grace received. You know, there's another story. It's uh, about this woman, and it's, it's in John 8. It's about a woman caught in the act of adultery, which is a funny way to say it because it's hard to catch a woman in the act of adultery by herself. Uh, but when she's brought before Jesus, she's, it's just her. And there's some cultural stuff going on here too because, uh, see, that in this day, the local authorities, in the Romans this case, they allowed these micro-communities to govern themselves. It's part of why when we read Paul and we see, see the, some of the stuff he says to do to one another by way of like turn them over to Satan, it sounds really judgmental to us, but what we have to understand is that they didn't have the sophisticated law system we do. They replied upon local communities to self-govern and to get excommunicated from one's local community was to be really, really vulnerable, so there was good motivation to not do that. Well, in the case of this dynamic, uh, the Romans gave the Jews a lot of license to self-govern, but they didn't give them license to kill people. So if their law said they need to die for that, at that point, the Roman law took over. Well, the situation here is, is that Jewish law says that a woman caught in the act of adultery needs to be stoned to death. And the way that works is everybody who thinks she's guilty is, has the right to pick up one softball-sized stone and throw it at, in this case, her. And the belief is that if enough people believe that and thus enough stones hit her, she dies. And if she dies, that demonstrates that was God's will in this situation. But in this situation, Roman law doesn't give them the right to do that. And so when they say, what do we do, they've trapped Jesus. Because if he says, kill her, then he's in trouble with Rome, and the Jews, they would have loved that. And if he says, uh, don't do anything, then he breaks his own law. And so Jesus, uh, being the keen intellect who always finds the third way that he seems to be, he just kind of stoops down in the dirt, and he says, hey, whoever's without sin, throw the first stone. Many of you know this story. And eventually he looks up, and nobody's there, and he says, woman, does nobody condemn you? And she says, no one, sir. And he says, then neither do I condemn you. Go and leave your life of sin. I guess I want to suggest to you that in the midst of this conversation, Jesus had another part of the equation, and it was that he, when, when we're having this conversation, Jesus had this remarkable way of not using condemnation as part of what's going on. That the shame that we often use, the withdrawal of love that people like myself are so vulnerable to, it's not the way he played the game. That there's this, there's this reality where, on the one hand, he gives people the right to make the wrong choice, and then when they do, he's the prodigal father waiting to welcome them back. He's, he gives them the right to make choices that will result in his experiencing tremendous pain and then when they return, he doesn't give them the what for for all the pain he's caused them. He offers no condemnation. Now, if the continuum looked tricky before, I hope adding that layer makes it even more tricky. So how, how do we bring any kind of resolution to this? There's a guy, Tim Elmore, who's done a bunch of research for, for decades on uh, especially college students. He's kind of just studied these generations and every ensuing one. And in one of the bits that I ran into as I was kind of working through all the material I could find on parenting and how do we add some new arrows to our quiver, so to speak, he said it this way, which is on one hand so simple, but on the other hand so profound. He says it this way. Uh, go ahead to that next slide. He, he says, more freedom equals more responsibility. But it works both ways. More responsibility equals more freedom. And his, his argument was that where, where we often struggle as parents is, is we want to give more responsibility, but we don't want to give more freedom. I guess it would be this way. And he says the reverse is also true. Our kids, they want more freedom, but they don't want more responsibility. And to whatever degree he says we can kind of analyze how we're doing within this tension, it's this. Is the responsibility that I'm expecting of them equal to the freedom that they're getting? Is, and from a student perspective, from the parented perspective, is the freedom I'm getting also, therefore, am I willing to take on the responsibility that comes with it? See, he, he's saying that as long as we keep these two measures equal, then at least we can begin to have a functional conversation. 
Now, how do we do this? There's a chapter in Gregston's book, Tough Guy and Drama Queens, that was probably the single most helpful thing to my wife and I, and most, she did most of the heavy lifting on the work of this. But he talks about contracts, which sounds as like opposite of intimate and relational as anything you might imagine. But part of what Gregson says in working with this freedom and responsibility tension is, is he says that one of the mistakes we make is we emphasize the freedoms that they don't have, not the ones they're going to get real soon. And Gregson's thing is constantly make the conversation about the freedoms and responsibilities that come next, and therefore not the ones they don't have. And so Gregson actually, he, he talks a lot about right contracts. And this is where my wife did a bunch of heavy lifting. Let's just take the cell phone thing. Because my kids promised that they were the only kids in the whole world who didn't have cell phones while still being in the seventh grade. And so we were just constantly going, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, not yet, not yet, not yet. And, and so what he, and he actually has a sample phone contract in the book. It's worth the price of the book just to see the way he processes this. But here's the way this works for him. Is it just puts on paper, literally, the answer to the questions uh, that we're asking about freedom and our kids' sake and about responsibility from the parents' sake. And it answers questions like this, when do I get a phone? And when I get a phone, who buys the phone? And if I break the phone that whoever bought buys, who replaces the phone? And who pays for the contract? Like, do I pay for some of the contract or do you pay for all of the contract? This gets into the freedom and responsibility thing. And when I get the phone, does it get to be next to my, on, my, on my nightstand when I go to sleep? Next to the whiskey bottle that I'm hoping also isn't there. <laughs> and if not, like, when, when do I get to put the thing on the, my nightstand next to me while I sleep? And when I get the phone, do I get to, do I get to take it to school? And if not, when do I get to take it to school? And, 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 and if I get a phone, what responsibility as it relates to things like jobs and grades come with that? And how do we interact within that? And, and is there a point at which um, you don't get the password login to my phone anymore? And if so, when is that? And, and are, we gonna, are you going to use one of those apps that monitor how often I can be on the phone? And, and what is the time frame there? How much time do I get in eighth grade? How much time do I get my sophomore year? Or are you not going to use one of those apps? And is there a point at which... Because it's my phone, it's also my bill. Now, you can see, you, you could do this with a car. You, you could do this with lots of things. I have a friend who did it with college, and his deal with his daughters for college was freshman year, here's the freedom. I pay, I pay 25% of your college expenses. Here's the responsibility that comes with that, and there were certain things that they had uh, to do. Sophomore year, I'll pay 50%, as long as you're meeting these responsibilities. Junior year, I'll, I'll pay 75%, again, as long as you're meeting these responsibilities. Senior year, I'll pay it all. I'm not saying any one of those are right, but it, it, I think it gets at some of what this tension brings to the surface, which is it's a conversation about freedom and responsibility, isn't it? And I think it's also a conversation about pain. Not just our kids, but our own. And maybe within our own internal dialogue with God, one of the good check valves is, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is this because of the pain that I'm afraid they're about to experience, or is this about me? You know, Jesus' story with his family, it has a final chapter, and it's, it's better than the one that we read. Because James, when Jesus was 30-ish, was like, you're a crackpot, I don't want anything to do with you. Please stop using our family name. But we know from Paul that after Jesus rose from the dead, Paul appeared to him. We know from early church history that Jesus' family kind of rallied. In fact, uh, there's historical evidence that in 90 AD, many of his family members were called to Rome because Rome was starting to feel threatened that Jesus' family had become kind of this royal family. And literally the way history records it is they showed, them his, they showed Caesar their hands and said, no, look it, we're farmers. But it points to this fact that Jesus' family did rally and follow him. In fact, while Peter... And Paul were out doing their missionary journeys across the world. James was the guy in Jerusalem leading the church. Why? Because Jesus went all Harry Potter on him when he was 30 and removed his right to choose? No. Listen, I, I don't know how you're relating this to parenting or relationships, or maybe this isn't a conversation about either. Maybe for you this is a conversation between you and God. And at the very least... I hope that we've captured that, that it might not be as black and white God determines everything as you might think. And if we can help you process that spiritually or otherwise, let us know. I'd like to pray, God. Thanks, Lord, that, uh, that your mind is bigger than ours and your systems, uh, that, 
they encompass and absorb all of the, the tensions and complications that we face with, face and deal with all the time. God, I pray as parents you'd make us people of courage and people of conviction and the wisdom to know how to navigate that. We love you. Amen. If you would like to engage further with Narrate Church, you can find contact information online, www.narratechurch.org. We would love to hear from you.